Welcome to Awake Us Now with Pastor Chris Dodge. Our programming is sponsored by Awake Us Now. And now here's Pastor Dodge with today's message. I'd like to pick up where we left off last time. And uh, as we've been seeing, working through the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus addresses some very uh, common issues that all of us deal with in one way or another. And we pick up today as he talks about worry. And let's face it, I mean, that is something that, that weighs heavily. Uh, we worry about worrying. And then we worry some more. And Jesus speaks very clearly about this in his great Sermon on the Mount. And he has been reminding us all along that God is good, that God cares for his children, that God desires that we know him and experience the joy of a living relationship with him, not just today and tomorrow, but forever. And Jesus makes it very clear that that relationship is anchored in him, the one whom the Father has sent. And so he tells us now, verse 25 of chapter 6, he says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Jesus is saying, don't spend your life worrying about things that you can't change anyway. Instead, recognize that God is the ultimate provider, that he is the giver of every good and perfect gift. By the way, that is something that was internalized by one of Jesus' relatives, his half-brother James, who said that every good and perfect gift comes down from above. James, who had been formerly a skeptic, became a follower of Jesus and one of the leaders of the, uh, the body of believers in Jerusalem uh, after Jesus' resurrection and ascension and Pentecost. And uh, Jesus is simply telling us here, don't waste your time on things that will do no good. He goes on to say, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And what Jesus is getting at is that you and I matter to God. He is concerned about each and every one of us. You know, the enemy tells us we're no good or we've blown it too much or you, 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 the list goes on and on. But what Jesus is saying is our Heavenly Father cares about us. And if he even takes care of the birds, how much more will he care for us? And so Jesus says, can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life in fact, to the absolute contrary, one of the things that we have learned in the medical field about worry is that it shortens life rather than adding to it. And so Jesus says, and why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. And what Jesus is saying is, well, he's saying this, if that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Jesus says, look at the creation. Look at what God has done. And, and he uses this analogy then. He talks about the, the grass of the field and the flowers that are here today and tomorrow are thrown into the fire. And what he's referring to is that in Israel at this time, they would use clay ovens and oftentimes would take you know, dried grasses and other things to light up those fires. Those things that had been so beautiful a few days earlier now are decaying and they're great fuel for the flames. And Jesus says, if God is so good that he makes the grass and the flowers this gorgeous, even though they end up being cut and thrown into the fire, he says, won't he give you all that you need? And so, Jesus says, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Jesus keeps coming back to this. He, he doesn't let go of this. It's not a, a quick word, and then let me go on to another topic. He recognizes how this is so much an integral part of our lives in a fallen world. And what he's saying is when we know him and our hearts are anchored in him and our, our hopes are, are founded upon him, that worries will disappear. 
not that there won't be difficulties, but we realize God is good. Our Lord is with us. He'll never leave or abandon us. That's the promise he makes to all of us who are his followers. And so Jesus says, your heavenly Father knows what you need. So don't worry, don't waste your time, don't waste your energy. Instead, bring those things to God. Jesus is saying, don't waste your time on worry. Don't borrow trouble. Instead, he says, seek first his kingdom, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Seek to know the living God, walk with Christ, follow the Holy Spirit's guidance and direction. And he says, all these things will come to you as well. And then, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Jesus doesn't deny that there are gonna be troubles. He doesn't deny that there will be difficulties in the days ahead. To the contrary, he warns us about such things. But what he is saying is, don't worry because God has this. Even in the most difficult of times, the Lord has it. And I can testify from personal experience with worry how true Jesus' words are. It is easy to worry. But I've also seen from personal experience that in those difficult times, there is great strength in the Lord. And the Holy Spirit does minister to our hearts, does give us strength, even in the face of those difficulties and trials. You may be going through some very significant ones right now, and perhaps they're keeping you up at night or disturbing your, uh, your attitudes and uh, raising your fears. And what Jesus is saying is, look to your heavenly Father, look to the Lord Jesus Christ, rely on the Holy Spirit, God is good, he is going to see you through and he will give you what you need for the current trials. At that point, Jesus goes on to another issue that again, we all wrestle with, and that's the notion of judging. Uh, and I'm not talking here about uh, judging between what is right and what is wrong, but rather being critical of other people. Now, here's the way Jesus expresses it. This is chapter seven, beginning at verse one. Jesus says, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now, these words of Jesus are frequently used by individuals who say, how dare you judge what I am doing? Judge not and you shall not be judged. And, and what they mean is you don't have any right to tell me that something is right or wrong. That is not what Jesus is talking about here. You know, the Bible is very clear. There are moral absolutes. God did not give us 10 suggestions. He gave us 10 commandments. The New Testament does not simply say, well, do whatever feels good. It says, put to death those things. And then it lists a whole host of things that are self-destructive and dangerous. We are called to be discerning but what Jesus is addressing here is the kind of gossipy, mean-spirited, um, self-righteous attitudes that cause us to look at others and tear them apart, either directly or in our own minds or in the quiet of our homes when they're not around. And so Jesus says, don't judge others in a way that you don't want to be judged. Now, personally, I want to be corrected by God's word, don't you? I want to be corrected in a way that is going to be helpful and that will strengthen, guide, direct, and bless me. Jesus is not saying, don't give guidance and help to others. What he's saying is, don't be a judgmental individual who's always fault-finding Instead, be like your heavenly father. What do we know about our heavenly father? He is slow to anger, quick to forgive, is filled with steadfast love. We are to be like him. And, and the New Testament makes it very clear that we are to be discerning individuals. Uh, the Apostle Paul expresses it this way in Romans 12, verse two. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed 
by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Jesus then continues and He says, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? Jesus is using hyperbole here to express a very important point, and that is we are not to judge others in a way that is contrary to God's plan and purpose. We are not to be the kind of gossipy, judgmental people who are always fault-finding with others, and yet don't listen to what the Word of God is saying to us. And so Jesus goes on, you hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. What he's saying is look in the mirror and respond to what God is revealing through His Word of truth, through the teaching of our Lord Jesus. Don't be the kind of person who is always tearing others down Instead, become more and more like your heavenly Father as you walk by faith. Jesus then goes on to Matthew 7, verse 6. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Now, keep in mind, in the Jewish world of Jesus' day, dogs were looked upon as basically pack animals that you didn't want around. And pigs were unclean. Uh, you know, they were not kosher. Uh, what Jesus is talking about here is, again, discernment. Be discerning. Uh, don't give dogs what is sacred. Don't throw pearls to pigs. It's, it's basically what he once said here also in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15, verse 14, as he was talking with his disciples, and, and they were talking how the, the disciples were saying how the Pharisees were so offended at the things that Jesus had said. And Jesus' response in uh, Matthew 15, verse 14 is, he says, leave them, they're blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. On another occasion, Jesus sent his disciples out two by two to go to various towns. And he said, when you get there, share the word. If they receive you, stay. If they don't, shake the dust from your feet. In other words, be discerning. Don't waste your time. Use it wisely. Then Jesus goes on. And I've labeled this section simply with the phrase, ask. A period, S period, K period, because Jesus speaks about asking, seeking, and knocking. And uh, these are some incredibly important words that have much to say to us in our relationship with God and in our desire to grow and mature in our faith. And so this is what Jesus says, beginning in verse 7. He says, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Please note, he doesn't say, ask and maybe God will respond. He doesn't say, seek and perhaps you'll find something of value. He doesn't say, knock and, you know, maybe the door will end up being opened in the long run. No, he says, these things will happen. Do this, he says, ask, seek, knock, an imperative, and then, absolute future you will you will be given you will find the door will be opened and Jesus says for everyone in case you didn't get it <laughs> Jesus goes on he says for everyone who asks receives the one who seeks finds and the one who knocks the door will be opened in other words God responds to his children who come to him and recognize our own need. As Jesus put it at the beginning of this, this sermon, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says, God answers everyone, anyone who comes to him with an open heart. 
is going to receive what he desires to impart to us. And then Jesus says this, and I love these words. He says, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? You know, I'm a dad and I'm a grandfather. I love giving gifts to my kids. I love giving gifts to my grandchildren. If they ask, I will respond. And Jesus is saying, if you, a sinner, because we are all sinners, there's only one who has been sinless, and that's our Lord Jesus Christ, and we killed him for it. But all of us are sinners, and if sinners know how to give good gifts to our kids, how much more will our Heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask? I think it's interesting to compare these words from Matthew 7 with what Jesus says in Luke 11, verse 13, because he says something very similar. Luke 11, 13 reads like this. Jesus says, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now, some people look at that and say, well, that must be a contradiction because those words differ. My response to that is, you think Jesus only said this once? This is critical teaching. Do you think it was once and done? No. I'm guessing he said this and things like it over and over again, and it's so important for us to hear that. And so Jesus says, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. Everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. Everyone who knocks, the door will be open. How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts, give his Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Ask. Then Jesus says, so in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. As he's been talking about this all along now, he summarizes things once again. One of the sad things that we have seen over the centuries is that many people look at the Sermon on the Mount as a matter of do-goodism. I've got to do this to earn favor with God. And what Jesus is saying is the absolute contrary. I do this because I have favor with God. I want to do this because I know his abundant love, his mercy in Christ Jesus, his power through the Holy Spirit. I want to do these things. I want to be, as a follower of Christ, I want to be like him. I want to be like my Heavenly Father. I want to have the character of the God who made me, gave himself for me, and is coming back for me. And so Jesus says, in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. As God is merciful, gracious, long-suffering, forgiving, we are to be the same. And we do that not to earn our salvation, but because our salvation is a gift and we want to share that gift with other people. That's why we can even love our enemies as Jesus has directed us. And Jesus says, this sums up the law and the prophets. In other words, that is the cliff notes of the Old Testament scriptures. <laughs> do to others as you would have them do to you. Be like your heavenly Father, good, kind, generous, faithful, loving. Well, at that point, Jesus goes on to talk about the narrow gate. And here again, he uses some very vivid imagery to get across an incredibly important point. He says, enter through the narrow gate, verse 13. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Obviously, Jesus is saying, many individuals in this world choose to reject what God has offered. It's important, the most important thing in all of our lives 
to know the living God, to trust him, to follow our Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, be sure you're entering through the narrow gate. Now the question is, what is the narrow gate? Some people look at this and they say, well, that means I've got to be upright here and I need to do this and do that. And I, I need to judge those other people who aren't doing that. That's not what it's saying. What is the narrow gate? The answer is it's Jesus. In fact, he talked about that very thing. Listen to these words from John chapter 10, verses 7 to 10. This is what Jesus says. And I, I quote, therefore, Jesus said again, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate, Jesus says, verse 9. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He is the gate. They will come in and out and find pasture. The thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Or as another translation puts it, have it abundantly. He gives abundant life. He is the narrow gate. And what this is saying is we have fullness not by being narrow, rigid individuals who are boasting about what we have done, but rather by being humble, repentant individuals who have turned to the only one who can save us, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the narrow gate. And we want to call others and invite others to go through the narrow gate as well, not as judgmental individuals, but as individuals who have understood the love of God, who loved this world so much that he gave his only son. And we want to lead others to experience him, the narrow gate. And then Jesus goes on. And as he talks about the dangers of spiritual warfare in this world, the dangers of the enemy who seeks to divert people from the narrow gate and take them on the wide way that leads to their eternal destruction, Jesus now warns about prophets and he says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. Jesus understands and he wants us to understand that this is a spiritual war and that we are facing an evil enemy. The devil, Jesus tells us in the Gospel of John, is a liar. He's a murderer. When he lies, he speaks his native language, is the way Jesus puts it. And he warns us that his followers, the devil's followers, are, are not just like the devil, but they are also like the devil in that they're sneaky. And he says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inside they're wolves. And you think of all the pictures that have been painted over the years of a wolf wearing a sheepskin over his head. And uh, what Jesus is saying is, be careful. Make sure they're not leading you astray. He says, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes? or figs from thistles. Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Jesus says, watch out for the false teachers who may say things that are easy to accept, but contrary to God's word, who point us in a direction other than the Lord Jesus Christ, who, who say, it doesn't matter. False teachers usually go to one extreme or the other. The one extreme is to say it doesn't matter what you do, do whatever you desire. And the opposite extreme is to say you're saved by doing this, so you better be good and you better do such and such and you better do so and so. Jesus says that's the tactics of the enemy. Be discerning again. That, that word discernment, I think, although it doesn't appear here in uh, this part of the Sermon on the Mount, it, it's certainly an overriding theme. Be discerning, Jesus says. And he says, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. That is where we have to stop. Our time is up. We're almost at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And I look forward to seeing you next time, okay?
Thanks so much for listening to Awake Us Now with Pastor Chris Dodge. Today's program was sponsored by Awake Us Now. If you are asking yourself, now what? We encourage you to learn more about God at our website, awakeusnow.com. And please come back and join us again next time.